Welcome to Introduction to Public Policy. Before we begin, let me offer an overview of the course. There are eight modules, each with a specific topic, and the last few modules will be merged with a case study, President Obama's struggle to pass the Affordable Care Act while trying to control the deficit. A few suggestions to get the best out of this course. Read the assigned chapters before you listen to the lectures. While reading, take good notes and think about what you are reading. Does it make sense? Do you agree with the arguments that Anderson makes? The lecture will only cover parts of the readings. Nonetheless, you are responsible for all the contents in the textbook, whether discussed in the lectures. Furthermore, there will be information in the lectures which do not appear in the readings. You are responsible for this information as well. Any information in the readings and the lectures may appear as a quiz question. That being said, the quizzes are not cumulative. Each module quiz will ask information from the assigned readings and lecture for that module. Let us now begin our exploration of public policy beginning with the first module. This first module can be a little abstract. It involves how to think about policies. What are the major approaches to public policy? That is, what are the approaches one might think about public policy? Although this module might be challenging, it is essential to understand before we venture into the topics of the other modules. Politics, Policy, and the People are nearly impossible to fully understand, especially American politics, American policy, and the American people. Why did the working class support conservative Ronald Reagan? Why are American progressive policies like health care about 40 years behind that of Europe? But other fairly progressive policies like public education at all levels are equal or greater than that of Europe as far as being accessible to all. Even the experts often have difficulties understanding American policy and politics. C. Wright Mills and Robert Dahl cannot agree on who governs America, elites or non-elites. What powers do parties yield? Is the party over, as David Broder and Keith Sutherland contend? Or has the party just begun, as Larry J. Sabato claims? Are Americans apathetic about politics, as Robert Putman argues, or are Americans very involved with politics, as Russell Dalton proposes? The complexities of public policy lead political scientists and public policy theorists to seek simple, parsimonious, but yet comprehensive theories that can explain most political phenomenon. Such generalizations often come at the price of preciseness. Anderson, in the textbook, reviews five theories or approaches that can help one better understand politics and public policy. They include political systems, group theory, elite theory, institutionalism, and rational choice theory. If the political scientist or policy analyst is honest with herself, she would admit that her explanation is just one of many possible explanations. When analyzing policy, it is prudent to consider more than one approach. You may be familiar with some of these approaches because they are used in many disciplines such as psychology, economics, history, and even ecology. Let us now explore these general approaches. The political systems approach is a part of a larger movement called behaviorism, which was a popular movement in the 1960s and early 1970s in the social sciences. Behaviorism was made popular in psychology by B.F. Skinner. It was then quickly adopted by political scientists, in particular by David Easton in his book Systems of Analysis. The idea behind behaviorism is that social action is just too complex to explain. Nonetheless, we might be able to predict behavior. Consider the following example. Whenever there is a threat of a hurricane, sales of Pop-Tarts increase. Why? Perhaps the snack is seen as a self-contained meal requiring no preparation. Perhaps it is comfort food. These are among many plausible explanations. 
but do the retailers need to know why people buy Pop-Tarts before a hurricane? All they need to do is predict behavior and not explain it. During hurricane season, the store should stock up on Pop-Tarts. Political system and behaviorism concern inputs and outputs, but not what is in between. There are inputs, such as public opinion, the media, pressure from interest groups, which are fed into a black box, like the legislative process, which in return produces outputs or legislation. Explaining why a bill becomes policy is not as important as predicting what inputs lead to what outputs. Such an approach is parsimonious and focuses on what is important for many political analysts, prediction rather than explanation. Consider the famous Phillips curve, which states whenever unemployment goes down, inflation goes up. Policy analysts do not need to know why this occurs. All they need to know is that the relation between the inputs, in this case the rise in unemployment, and the outputs, the decrease in inflation, and then design policy with this in mind. One problem with behaviorism is that it neglects explanation. If we can understand a theory, then we can better detect any weakness in the theory. Knowing why low unemployment leads to inflation might inform the analyst when high unemployment and inflation can coexist. In the mid-1970s, the U.S. experienced high unemployment and high inflation, countering what the Phillips curve predicted. One element that is overlooked is an external shock to the system. In the 1970s, the oil-producing exporting countries, OPEC, artificially raised the price of oil. Since the United States highly depends on oil, the price of consumer goods increased inflation despite high unemployment. 